Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm really happy to have everybody here. Uh, of course, you all know that we're joined today by Lisa Dicker, uh, who is the, at the Harvard Law School, uh, lecturer on law and clinical instructor. She's also an alumni from uh, the Baker Center from UTK, um, super involved uh, with uh, the Baker Center, and as an alumni supporting students, uh, I've contacted her several times, always willing to help out in whatever way she can. So before we get going uh, and I turn the event over to her, we are going to go ahead and get your lunches. Um, so it'll be a bit chaotic for a moment. That's just fine. If you want to uh, grab those, come sit down, and then uh, we'll, we'll get started here. So just a couple minutes to do that. Thanks for coming. Sitting here, moving them around, and now they have to sit back there. But Great advice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just wanted to ask a lot more about like the job that asked for yeah. so I'm really excited about it. Excellent. Thank you for being here. Yeah. I'm okay. I'll grab it afterwards. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, so I will never stand between students and their food. Um, so feel free, eat, drink, get up, get more things that you want. It will not bother me one bit. Um, uh, as John said, I'm Lisa Dicker. So I graduated from the University of Tennessee in 2014. I was a Baker Scholar. Um, I was in the learning community. Are any Baker Ambassadors here? Excellent. So I was part of the first class of Baker Ambassadors, too. So the center had just opened like a year before I got to undergrad. And so it's absolutely delightful to be back and to see it still thriving and with like students in person right now too, which I know has been hard the last couple of years. So after I graduated from undergrad, I went straight to Harvard Law School. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do something around conflict. I did a lot of study in my undergrad on international relations. I knew that I wanted to do something that was around like resolving tensions. And when I was at HLS, um, I really started focusing in on the intersection of international law and armed conflict. And that led me to negotiations. So when I graduated from law school then, I worked for several years full time in armed conflict and peace negotiations. I spent about four and a half, five years advising the Syrian opposition's negotiation delegation um, to the Geneva peace process. Um, then I also worked um, with the Sudanese opposition um, during the civilian revolution and then through the peace negotiations that occurred afterwards. And so on March 12th, 2020, I woke up in Juba, South Sudan on the negotiations compound where I had been for, you know, on and off for several months at that point. 
and I had about 200 missed calls and messages, and I thought, it's my birthday, everyone loves me so much. It was, in fact, my birthday, and everyone did love me, but they were trying to get me back in the country because borders were starting to close. Um, I continued to work remotely on the Sudanese process uh, in the coming months. And as you can imagine, with remote learning and everything that, I that you all have experienced, that's hard in negotiations as well. We went from everybody in big packed rooms for peace negotiations to being able to do those virtually, um, and then slowly back in person. I transitioned back to Harvard Law School that summer in 2020 um, to teach negotiations, transitional justice, um, and other, other courses in the um, dispute resolution context, like dispute systems design. One thing that I really love about this field, and I'm really excited to have an assortment of folks that I imagine are coming from lots of different majors, backgrounds, years, careers, interests, et cetera, is that negotiation is a skill that permeates everything that you do. And so I love teaching a course called the Negotiation Workshop at the, at the law school um, because we draw in lawyers and also cross-registrants from the business school, from the Fletcher School on International Relations, from the Kennedy School on Governance, to come into a class for a semester. We spend eight hours a week together and we do negotiations. We do simulations, we do skills building, and so forth in order to develop the skills they'll be using in their careers. And there's so much you can learn from each other in your negotiation styles and what's effective and what you find persuasive and then onboard skills that others are doing. That cross-pollination is key in negotiations. And so we're gonna model that today for the next 90 minutes together, what this looks like in the law school's classroom too. The skills building aspect of it, which includes little bits of mini instruction from me, trying it on for yourself through um, discussion through simulation through activity and we'll be building towards in our um, in our hour and a half together a full simulation at the end where we'll get the chance to negotiate with each other and then reflect on how it went so I'm gonna have to get closer where I can actually clip what is negotiation simple enough it's any time you are attempting to influence or persuade someone. So what does that look like? Oftentimes I imagine when you think of negotiation, you think of a couple people in suits, sitting down at a business table, hammering out a deal, shaking hands, yeah? Because we think of it sometimes as a skill that we're not going to reach until we get into our professional lives. But we actually negotiate all the time. We negotiate with our friends, family members, significant others on where we're going to eat in the evening. What's that, what that's going to look like. I imagine some of you all potentially Valentine's Day earlier this week was a negotiation. Maybe one of the more difficult ones that you've had recently. Kids negotiate all the time on the playground. That's one of the, the crucial skills that they're learning in elementary school. How are we navigating relationships with each other? How are we, when we have a difference, when there's the same toy that we want, how are we addressing that? And some of the most skilled negotiators, or at least the most effective negotiators, are infants. They're really, really capable of getting parents to do exactly what they want them to do. They're learning those communication skills. And unfortunately, they're not, not quite under, able to understand the reason that's happening on the other side um, of their negotiation. So to unpack, unpack this a bit, we've been negotiating all of our lives. And the purpose in taking courses or doing wor many workshops on negotiation is to start viewing those as negotiation so that we're reflecting on what's working and what's not working in them and how we can improve. So negotiation is a skill. Sometimes we hear that you know, great negotiators are born. Someone just has it. They have the charisma. They have the ability to be persuasive. They have the influence. They actually don't. You're not just born with that. That's developed somewhere along the way. People have learned to get better and better at negotiations. Sorry, I think it's trying to time it. So, negotiation is a skill set that can be developed and benefits. Sorry, one second. Okay. Negotiation is a skill that can be developed and benefits from training, practice, and reflection. And even the most skilled negotiators can benefit from training, practice, and reflection. If you think of the most skilled negotiators that you know, they are also folks that can learn from this process. So we're gonna start this with a small exercise. It's called the ugly orange exercise.
Dr. Jones, we're going to start with him. In his country, there is an outbreak of the Zika virus. Dr. Jones has developed a chemical cure to prevent Zika. The chemical is made from the ugly orange, a very rare fruit. It's made from the, ju the juice of the ugly orange. That's how you create the chemical. And a fruit exporter has 3,000 ugly oranges remaining. Unfortunately, it's a very rare fruit in the world. Dr. Rowland, in Dr. Rowland's country, two experimental nerve gas bombs have developed leaks. Dr. Rowland has developed a synthetic vapor to neutralize the gas, uses the rind of the orange. Unfortunately, Dr. Rowland would also need 3,000 ugly oranges to make enough vapor. We've got a problem here. We've got a negotiation. 3,000 oranges, two countries need it. The stakes are pretty high. The ugly orange grower who has these oranges is the only one in the world that has them and only has 3,000 oranges available. The grower has decided that they will sell the ugly oranges to the highest bidder. And the grower has told Dr. Jones and Dr. Rowland that they are the two bidders on the oranges. There's no one else involved. But it is the two of them, and the grower sees an opportunity for profit. There's crisis. Two countries desperately need these oranges. How can I create the most profit from it? Fortunately for Dr. Rowland and Dr. Um, uh, and Dr. Jones, they've enlisted the help of a team of advisors, everyone in this room. And before Dr. Roland or Dr. Um, Jones go to the grower, they've decided to reach out to each other to negotiate the purchase of the oranges, to see if they can come up with an agreement between the two of them before they have to go into an auction for the highest bidder. So, what would you advise them to do? They're negotiating with each other. They've enlisted the help of an advisor. You all, you're their team. What should they do? How can they reach a fair agreement? What do you think? Yeah, Reem? Excellent. So we shouldn't engage in a bidding war. They need two different parts of the oranges. Let's see if we can split them up in some way and come to an agreement surrounding that. Any other ideas? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so there's a way that everyone can get the way they want. Maybe we don't split them up ourselves. We can have someone else extract the juice and the rinds um, over to Dr. Roland. Any other ideas? Excellent. So creative solutions, right? Because as you all picked up on, we've got Dr. Jones who needs the juice and Dr. Roland who needs the rinds. And I will say that sometimes when we do this exercise, the first thing that comes to mind before we start assessing that one person needs the juice and one person needs the rinds and we're able to come to an agreement that we actually don't have to divide this, this 3,000 is something along the lines of like, oh gosh, maybe we should take it 50-50. We can at least save half of the population in each country. We can each take 1,500 of the oranges. Something else that comes to mind may be something something along the lines of like, which country is more powerful? They're gonna be the ones that end up with these oranges. And when we start engaging in trying to split the difference before looking at the interests of the parties and figuring out is there a way to make this work, that's called positional bargaining. Positional bargaining would be 3,000 oranges, I'm taking all 3,000, you're gonna take 3,000, the other party wants 3,000 of them and somehow we try to divide the difference between them. We see this a lot in negotiations. If you think of um, any time that you've been in some sort of marketplace, a bazaar, um, potentially if you've gone to a flea market uh, as well, 
you talk to the seller, they say the price of the particular item that you're looking at, it may be, let's say, a lamp. They give you a price, you give them an, a lower price, you start to haggle between it, and you try to reach a deal. And sometimes it's somewhere in the middle. It's a really common form of negotiation, one of the most common that we see. But it focuses on the position of each party, demands for a certain outcome or action. And the parties take positions, argue for those positions, and then they make concessions between them. And it's how we approach a lot of problems in negotiation. We, we view them as purely distributive. How can we divide this up? What cut of the pie do I get? What this looks like in practice often is each party takes positions that are pretty far apart in the negotiation. And then they each talk about their positions. I want the lamp, give me, a, um, uh, I want to buy the lamp. The seller says it'll be $100. The buyer says this is no worth, than five, more, worth more than $5. See the scratch on it. Then they each make concessions. The seller might say, OK, it does have a scratch on it. I'll sell it to you for $90. The buyer says, well, a discount is good, but I'm not paying any more than, than $15 for it. They take those new positions. There may be a threat to walk. The buyer may say, there's actually a lamp down the way that I also saw and really quite liked. I'm going to go get that instead. The, buyer insult, or the, the seller insults their alternatives and says, like, yeah, but if you go down there, they're known to be a swindler. They say it's an antique. It absolutely is not one. They insult that. They get them back at the table. Each party makes new concessions. And they attempt to reach an agreement. Maybe they settle on $30. Maybe they settle on $60. Maybe they split the difference and go for $50. Um, but you see this kind of haggling that's occurring on both sides. You've probably seen some of these types of negotiations in the news as well, on business deals, for instance, or on labor deals, too. They're trying to split the difference. Parties seem decently far apart. They get, it gets narrow, it gets narrow, and there's some sort of difference that is split at the end. It's an appropriate form of negotiation in some settings. Perhaps there's not too much of a better way to do it at a flea market. Um, but there's risks to positional bargaining as well. It causes an escalation in tensions. When you're making and giving concessions, and when you're stating positions, which are demands, it can really escalate the tensions. You can imagine in the ugly orange example, if Dr. Rowland's country and Dr. Jones's country had been haggling like we just saw over the oranges, can you imagine what the diplomatic um, uh, ramifications would be between those two countries? It can really quite escalate tensions. It can also damage relationships as well because the tensions are being escalated. And also because it often results in an agreement that neither party is fully satisfied with, or even partially satisfied with. There can sometimes be an assumption in negotiations that if each side feels like they um, feel some pain in the agreement, that it's a good agreement, as long as that pain is equally felt. But that's not good for the relationship. It causes an escalation of tensions, and neither party is truly satisfied with the agreement that they reached as well. We want to take a more positive spin on negotiation. And it can also oftentimes prevent agreements that, sh um, that should have from happening. If we had started in a positional negotiation with the ugly orange, instead of thinking of those interests, we might not have come to an agreement. There may have been a standoff between the countries. Neither, um, neither party may have ended up with them um, as well. And then we wouldn't have reached an agreement that we could have otherwise come to, or we would have resort resorted potentially to other options. And it ignores creative solutions like hiring someone to extract the juice, shipping them to one country first to do it, um, and then being able to build off of that for an agreement instead. So an alternative form of negotiation is called interest-based negotiation. And it focuses on the interests of each party. And we're going to get into what exactly interests are um, in more detail. But in short, interests are the hopes, needs, goals, desires, et cetera, that motivate the positions that parties are taking. I want 3,000 oranges. Why? To save the population of the country, to be able to use the juice of them. Those are interests. I want 3,000 as a position. And in interest-based negotiation, instead of focusing on the positions and trying to force concessions from each party, we instead focus on the interest and identify 
um, uh, each party's interests, our own, those of the other party, in order to generate options that improve the satisfaction of those interests. So we're looking, if you think of it as like a pie that needs to be divided at some point, you're gonna try to grow that first through creative options and then slice it up. There's still some distributive elements to the ugly orange situation, right? Someone's still gonna get their hands on them first. There may be some, and if they get their hands on them first, they're going to be able to develop the cure for their own country first. There's some time elements that are still going to be distributed. But we're gonna expand it first and say, we're all going to have access to what we need from these. We're gonna start from there, and then we're gonna start looking at criteria on how we divide this up. Maybe one country is able to produce faster and should have them first. Maybe one country is in more immediate need of them. Um, they need it on a 48 hour window as opposed to two weeks perhaps. And we can start looking at that criteria to divide it, but grow the pie first. So when I teach classes on negotiation, we focus on these seven elements of interest-based negotiation. Again, positional bargaining is primarily focused on demands for a certain outcome or action, the position. Interest-based negotiation focuses instead on seven elements of negotiation. Alternatives, interests, options, criteria, relationship, communication, and commitment. That was fast, don't worry, we'll go through them all. But we're gonna focus on these today. Alternatives, interests, options, and criteria. The reason being they're the foundation for the others. So. To introduce relationship, communication, and commitment. And then I will like weave them in today, but we won't spend a ton of time on each one of them. Relationship is focused on the dynamic between the parties. Yeah? And in negotiation, you want to, if possible, seek to improve the relationship between the parties. Because there are very few times that you're doing a truly one-off negotiation with someone. And you want to be able to have the ability to reach future deals with them or to be able to gain benefit from the relationship that you have. Even in one things that may appear to us to be one-off deals, in May I bought a car for the first time, hooray, it may appear to be a one-off deal between me and the car salesman. But I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The car dealership was in the town over in Belmont. I have several other friends who have been looking for cars in the next year. I had a one-off relationship maybe with this salesman, but his reputation is something that I've been spreading as well. So relationship is something in negotiations that we wanna keep an eye towards. And that's why we wanna be careful with positional bargaining because it escalates tensions and can damage relationships. It can thus damage our ability to have future deals with this party, but can also damage our ability to have future deals with other parties. Communication is the way that we are communicating in negotiations, the way that we're expressing um, our assertiveness, the way that we're taking in the perspective of the other party, the questions that we're going to be asking. We're gonna practice that when we're in our negotiation today. We're not gonna spend a, a lot of time specifically naming those skills. And then commitment. We want negotiations, agreements that are specific and implementable. Specific, we know the terms, both parties or all of the parties know exactly what the terms are and where they're going to go forward with it. And they're implementable, Can, are they feasible? Can we actually implement this? And that's connected to both communication, because you need to be clear, and relationship as well. If you've damaged the relationship to a degree that someone defects from the agreement afterwards, we've got a problem there. So those are the, the last three elements of negotiation, and we'll see them come up in the exercises we're gonna do. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on them today. But we're gonna start with alternatives. An odd place to start, potentially, but I'll tell you why it makes sense. Alternatives are the walkaway possibilities that each party has if no agreement is reached. What will the parties do if they cannot reach an agreement? So alternatives are away from the table. We often confuse these with options because we use those terms interchangeably in our daily lives. When we're thinking about negotiation, we wanna be clear on the terms of art. Alternatives are away from the table. So why does that matter? Well, because to come to an agreement in the negotiation, we're gonna to have to beat both parties' best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Because if we don't beat that, we shouldn't come to an agreement with the other party, right? So an agreement is successful. And this is my measure, one of my measures of success in negotiation. If the agreement that you are reaching is better than your best alternative to negotiated agreement, it's better than your BATNA. In negotiations, we can sometimes wonder is this it? Do I sign on now? Have I done all that I can do? 
maybe there's still room to create more value, maybe there's a slightly better deal that you have been reached, but I'm gonna be satisfied with an agreement ultimately. If I've communicated properly with the other party, if I've done my due diligence to add value to the agreement, I think that I've gotten as far as I can with it, but I'm gonna walk away smiling if it is an agreement that is better than my best alternative to a negotiated agreement because it's better than I would do if I left the table to go satisfy my interests elsewhere. So because I teach negotiation, I will often get calls from friends like five minutes before they're going into a salary negotiation, five minutes before they're gonna go you know, negotiate with, the negotiate with the landlord over their rent, five minutes before they go um, to a car dealership. You can tell that this happens a lot to me. And they're like, so, what advice do you have? I'm like, well, you should have called me three weeks ago, and we could have done some detailed preparation for your salary negotiation. Um, but unfortunately, that's where, not where we're at right now. So my one piece of advice, if I can give it in like five minutes to someone, 30 seconds, is what's your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? What's your BATNA? Have that clearly in mind. And don't agree to anything that is worse than your BATNA. If your BATNA in a salary negotiation is taking a position elsewhere, then do not come to an agreement in your salary negotiation that is worse than that, right? If you could switch apartments and go pay lesser rent and have a better location, but those trade-offs, you would rather stay in the same apartment so you don't have to move and slightly decrease your rent or not increase it much, always be looking at your BATNA. So walk away from the table if it's not better than your BATNA. The next is interests. The needs, concerns, goals, desires, and fears that motivate us. This is what's underlying those positions. So let's think about this in practice. We were just talking about apartments. Let's pretend that you all are all real estate agents. Yeah, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, where I live, there's a whole lot of real estate agents and brokers that you have to deal with even to rent apartments. It's a scam because you have to pay broker's fees as well. Um, but that said, you all right now are gonna be getting broker's fees if you can rent an apartment to the client that just walked in for you. And they come up to you and they say, I want a fourth floor apartment. That's the position. I want a fourth floor apartment. You look, up your, you look at your computer, you start scrolling through your listings and you don't see any for fourth floor apartments. You've got other floors, you've got standalone houses, You've got lots of options, you've got garden level, you've got ones that are higher up as well, but they have come in and given you the position, I want a fourth floor apartment. So, you don't give up there because you're a trained negotiator, and instead you start to think of yourself, to yourself, why might this person want a fourth floor apartment? So turn it over to you all. Why might someone take a position that they want a, an apartment on the fourth floor? Yeah. So they don't, sorry? Yeah, so they don't have noise above them. Maybe they're looking at most apartment buildings in this area are four, four stories, they don't have noise above them, yeah. Lucky number four, it's their favorite number. What else, yeah? Yeah, they want higher views, they wanna see World Fair Park, yeah. Yeah, they're like, this is my limit. I wanna, yeah, I want a fourth floor apartment, there's not a whole lot of elevators around here. I can comfortably take the groceries up, um, up the four stairs. What else? Yeah. Safety. Can you say more about that? Yeah. The higher rates of being broken into, it's going to be much safer on the, on the fourth floor. Maybe tied to being able to take the stairs to groceries, they're like, but I, I do want to take the groceries up some sets of stairs. I'm gonna get my steps in for the day. I'm in a constant you know, Apple Watch competition with some of my friends, so I want some stairs, but not too many stairs. So there's a lot of interest that could be at play here. Um, and we may be able to satisfy those interests in other ways, and we'll talk about that with options. We'll revisit this example if we know what they are. Because if we were just thinking of position, I want a fourth floor apartment, it'd be a pretty quick conversation and you would not be getting your broker's fee today. Because you would scroll through and say, I do not have any fourth floor apartments. There's no real way to split this difference. I will contact you when I get more listings in or you need to go elsewhere. But when we start thinking about positions, it's starting to open up the door for potentially other solutions. Because in positional bargaining, we're really only looking at the tip of the iceberg. The one way that they have stated that they could meet their interest. 
if their interests are safety, if their interests are being able to, um, uh, if their interests are safety, if their interests are being able to um, uh, get up the stairs into their apartment, but at the same time not have to climb six or seven stories, if they want a good view, if they want peace and quiet, there's maybe other ways to do that as well. Whereas positional bargaining just focuses on that tip of the iceberg. And underneath it are all of the interests. We use this image a lot in teaching negotiation to think of if they're giving a demand for a certain outcome and, or action, what's below the tip of the iceberg? What's happening? And then we're going to start looking at our, um, at our interests. We're going to do a quick exercise. We've had a chance to chat for a minute. So I want you to pair up. Just find someone around you. And the first thing that you're going to do is determine between the two of you who will be the buyer and who will be the seller. And then I'll continue your instruction. So find one person. All right, does everyone know who the buyer is and who the seller is? Yeah? All right, if you are the seller, take a second and find an item around you that you want to sell to the buyer. All of my sellers have an item? All right, sellers, you're gonna have two minutes on the clock and I'll time you, and I want you to persuade your buyer to buy that item. You have two minutes, go. Buyers, I'm going to check in with you first. Buyers, how many of you raise your hand if you're ready to buy this item? Okay, okay, I'm going to check. For those of you with your hands up that are ready to buy this item, I'm going to check in with you. What did your seller do that was effective? Saw a hand here. Excellent. So you, you, need, a, you need a pen to take notes. This is going to be your backup option if your iPad dies. And that was persuasive to you. Why was that persuasive to you? It's the only thing you have to take notes on. You're like, ah, I have no other, no other way to do this, and I want to be able to have notes. I have an interest in having notes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it back up. Who else was persuaded? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And, and what, what persuaded you about that? Yeah, and you were like, I, I for sure actually do not want to carry on my purse all the time. I would love to have a wallet to fit in my pocket. And I saw one other hand. Yeah. Oh, two other hands. The watch is from James Bond. Is the watch from James Bond? In this story, it is. Ethics in negotiation. Great. Um, and why was that persuasive to you? Ah, uh, you watched James Bond. Did you know that about him already? Like, oh, excellent. There's, the, there's a shortage here. You're going to have this special watch. It's from James Bond. And you look like a guy that would like James Bond. And you were persuaded as well? No, you're like, absolutely not. We'll get to you in just a second. All right, so it sounds like through these conversations, we, we started to hit at some of the interests that the other party had. 
you did have an interest in not carrying a first round and keeping it in your pocket. You do have an interest in James Bond and maybe having a watch that is different than everyone else's, something that's you know exclusive and elusive to have. You have an interest in having notes. So also speaking to the buyers, just gonna show of hands, how many sellers ask you any questions during these two minutes? Yeah? Let's start here. What question did your seller ask you? Ah. Oh. Excellent. So you're, you're actually ready to buy. You're like, ah, I've had some time to reflect. I'm ready to buy. So he asked you a question about if you're if you were eating, going to finish the roast beef sandwich. Who was your who was your seller? Yeah. Why did you ask that question? Yeah. You're asking questions to learn. Is this going to be something that he that he needs? Can I take the can I can I take the approach of saying you're going to need this because you're going to eat something salty? Yeah. What sell, what um, questions did your seller ask you? Ah. And why did you ask that question? Excellent. So again, you're trying to see like an interest could be to, ha to um, have a backup if her battery is going to die. But first, I need to ask her: Does she have her charger on her? I saw a hand over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what information did that give you? Yeah. Yeah. So what things do you like from be interested? I imagine if you had just launched into like these musicals on Hulu, that's not gonna land in the same way of now you know she likes friends. Another hand, yeah. Excellent. So we've had three pretty close-ended questions. Yes, no answers. Do you have your charger? Is that a musical on Hulu? Are you going to finish your roast beef sandwich? They give it, they give very specific information to the seller. Then you had an open-ended question. Do you have any any concerns? Anything else that you would like to say? Any any questions that you have for me? Open-ended questions can give us a lot of information that don't that don't relate to the assumptions that we already have. We want to be asking both types of those in our negotiations too, because we may fully miss a concern that you had. What item were you being sold? A pen. Yeah. And what did you have? Any questions? Or ah, you asked if it came in different colors. And had that been something that you had thought of, seller? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> You're like, this is something entirely out of the scope. I wouldn't know how to how to respond to this or how to um, meet this interest if I hadn't asked this broad and open-ended question about it. So, sellers. Let's be honest. Were there any of you that asked no questions for two minutes and gave your and gave your pitch? We got a couple. We got some. We got some. We got some faint hands over here. Be proud. This happens a lot of the time, right? Because we're like we have a short time to make a deal. We want this deal to happen, and I know what is the most persuasive pitch to me, and so I'm going to give it to them based on what is most persuasive to me and assumptions that I have about them. And sometimes it lands. James Bond was something that landed quite well. It also may have missed, like it would have missed over here if Spencer had started talking about Hulu musicals instead. And so it's a bit of a risk if we don't check in and ask those questions. And as it turns out in negotiations, we sometimes frame our assertiveness with what is most persuasive to us based on our own interests. And we've already persuaded ourselves we're really good at doing that. And what we need to be able to do in our communication is persuade the other party. So when I think about the iceberg of interest, if, oops, so when I think about the iceberg, if this is me, 
I do want to know my interests, but I also want to know those of the other party. Because in order to reach an agreement, I am also going to have to meet their interests as well better than their best alternative to a negotiated agreement would. I have to be able to beat their BATNA. And so I want to be focused on the interests of both myself and the interests of the other party as well. And one of the most effective ways to do that in negotiations is to be asking questions of the other party, to be able to understand their positions. So when we did our brainstorming around the fourth floor apartment, we're able to start to see and think of what the interests of the other, of the, um, uh, of the renter, the potential renter that's coming to our office are, but we don't know those for sure. So we don't want to immediately launch into option generate, generation with them because what we're saying may not land. If the person's concerned about safety, they may not be interested in, other, in apartments with other good views. That's not their primary concern here. And so we want to be able to test them through specific questions, like many of you asked, and through open-ended questions to see what we're missing. Because to reach an agreement, we're going to have to beat our BATNA and the BATNA of the other party, too. So when I sit down at the negotiation table, I keep in mind this image of an iceberg. If I'm hearing a position, I start probing for interest beneath it. I don't push back immediately on that position. I'm, still, I'm instead trying to understand what that why is and how I can meet that why. Which brings us to options. Options are all the possibilities on which the parties might agree. That's broad. Options are on the table. Alternatives are away from the table. Alternatives are what I will do to satisfy my agreement. The agreement can't be reached. Options are um, on the table. All of the possibilities upon which the parties might agree. I think of that as potential terms of an agreement. And we may throw out many options in a negotiation. We may brainstorm options together. But ultimately, our agreement is going to contain a package of those. So I want a fourth floor apartment. Let's say that you probed for interest, you asked some questions, and you found out that one of their key concerns was safety. And that's why they wanted an apartment on the fourth floor, far fewer break-ins. How might you satisfy those interests if you don't have any fourth floor apartments? If you're the broker, what other options might you put forward? How can you satisfy the interest of safety? Yeah, Stefan? Third floor. Like it's almost as safe as the fourth floor. How? Security cameras. I've got an apartment that's on the, that's on the first floor but it has security cameras. Any other ideas? Yeah. Bars on the windows. They're not getting into this place. What if their interest was that their lucky number was four? How might you satisfy that in other ways? Yeah. The apartment number can be four instead. So we're, pro we're gonna brainstorm ahead of time what it might be. We don't see that as a full roadblock to us coming to an agreement. And instead, we probe for, our, probe for interest. And now, we may be getting our broker speech day because we've been able to craft options that meet those interests instead. And the final element we're gonna speak of briefly is criteria. Criteria are the external criteria against which to measure possible agreement. This will help us in the distributive elements of our negotiations. There will still be, in many negotiations, prices involved. There may be time differences involved. Who's gonna get those oranges first? How do we carve those up? If I'm buying a car at a car dealership, what type of criteria am I looking at? So, Criteria can take a really broad range depending on the negotiation that you're in. So for instance, if I am buying a car, I might look at prices that other dealers are selling the car for. I might look at the CarMax or Kelly Blue Book evaluation of this car. I might take the car to a third party and have them do an evaluation of the condition that it's in and what cost it should be based on that. I could do the same thing for an apartment, right? I can look at others comparable in the area. If you're buying a watch, you can look at the criteria online as well. You can look those types of pieces up. So our criteria are gonna be the things that help us in those distributive elements um, in negotiations. What are we relying on in order to come to a, to a fair deal? We also feel a lot better about deals if they're grounded in some sort of fairness that we mutually agree upon, yeah? It can feel really hard to haggle in a flea market about a lamp if we're just kind of throwing out numbers and going back and forth. 
What if we were to pull out our phones and look up a similar lamp on eBay and base a price off of that? We tend to feel a lot better about it, which also helps preserve the relationship and the commitment, the implementability of it afterwards, our willingness to do so. So criteria can be both a, a sword for us in negotiations, it can back up the options that we're presenting. This is fair because I looked up online that the price of a, of a lamp is going for X right now. But it can also be a shield. They give us an absurdly high number for, um, for rent for this apartment, and you're able to show them a list of other similar apartments that are going for much, um, for much less. Um, so it can be a sword for us and a shield for us so that we don't immediately have to think that we have to come back if they've given us a high number with a low number and return to criteria instead. So that is a whirlwind tour of the first four elements of the seven elements of negotiation with the others threaded throughout. Alternatives, we're going to have to beat the best alternative to a negotiated agreement for both parties. Interests, what are the needs, hopes, desires, fears, goals that motivate us to negotiate? What's that why behind why we're negotiating? Options, all of the possibilities that we could agree upon that we're eventually going to narrow down um, through what meets our interests best, through what meets the other interests best, and what's grounded in criteria for those distributed pieces to come to agreement that are then preserve the relationship, don't make it worse, and might make it better, hopefully. We've been able to identify these pieces through communication, and that also leads to the ability to commit and for it to be implementable. So we're going to try it now. In just a moment, you're going to be handed out instructions for a case. You're going to be negotiating it at your tables. And these tables, the tables that you're sitting at are going to be a closed world universe. So you are the only people negotiating this. You are the only people negotiating this. So you don't have to um, uh, play along with the other tables. They're separate universes. This universe is called, or this case is called the U.S. Defense Task Force. It's the U.S., and you're trying to defend it. Because unfortunately for all of us, the zombie apocalypse has begun. So how this is going to work is you're going to be handed out in a moment your instructions. And you're going to have five minutes to read the instructions silently and start to form your own opinions about the, the ask that is happening. And do your preparation, because then you're going to have to negotiate with the other members of your table in order to see if you can reach an agreement in 15 minutes. What you're aiming towards at your table, and your instructions say this as well, is that you all are the US Defense Task Force at each table. You have a list of sev seven nominees to be on the US Zombie Survival Leadership Team. But the thing is, you have to unanimously agree on who those four members will be. You will have a report form that lists the four names, and you will all have to sign the, the report form. That's your commitment, if you can reach it, is figuring out amongst the seven who you believe that the four should be. And as this will detail in your instructions, if no agreement is reached, the head of the Department of State, the director, has decided that if no agreement can be reached, that they're heading to a press conference in 20 minutes, so after your five minutes to read and your 15 minutes to negotiate, and if you do not hand them a list of four names, they're going to nominate their own son to be the unilateral and sole person to lead the country through the zombie apocalypse. Their son, as you will find out in your instruction state, is a member of the US House of Representatives who is fairly inexperienced and does not seem to be a particularly good alternative, but you do have one. That's your BATNA. So you're gonna have to try to do something that is better than your son. All right, so if you'll take a second and hand out the instruction sheets, take the next five minutes to read them quietly to yourself, make notes, prepare for your negotiation with the rest of your team. All right, as these are going around, I'm going to start the timer for five minutes. Do not discuss with the rest of your team yet. Do not discuss before your negotiation begins.
have about one minute to finish up your preparation before you start your negotiation. All right, before I release you to negotiate, a few final reminders. If you come to an agreement, it must be on four people. It cannot be less than four. There's, it cannot also be more than four. You can't say we're gonna have an alternative that's gonna come in in a certain situation, they're gonna rotate in. It's gonna be four. It's gonna be announced in 15 minutes. And the country knows that you all are the US Defense Task Force that have selected this team. So your reputations are on the line and the history books will remember who set the country up for success in the zombie apocalypse or for failure in the zombie apocalypse. So I guess that they might not know if they set them up for failure because the apocalypse will have potentially been fully successful, but know that before everyone goes down, they know it was on you. All right, you have 15 minutes, good luck.
All right. Take a minute, so your last minute, to see if you can sign an agreement. And if you already have signed, be ready to justify it to the other tables. <laughs> Does it come in other colors? Does it come in other colors, though? <laughs> Got some that are down to the wire, some that finished a little earlier. Yeah, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You're in? Excellent. Congratulations. I think that all, all tables have reached agreements. Yeah? That doesn't always happen. So congratulations to you all. Now is your time to justify it. So I want to hear from each table who your nominees are and your like 90 second elevator pitch as to why you picked this team. What, about, what were you looking at? What's your 90 second elevator pitch to persuade the rest of the country that this should be their survival team and that they're going to entrust them with their lives during this? All right, let's go over here first. Who did you pick and why? Excellent. Thank you for our first group. Second group, who did you pick and what's your 90 second elevator pitch? Excellent. So we have two tables that have the same list of four, yeah? Let's go back here. Who do you have and why? Thank you. 
Okay, we've got at least 13 more years. <laughs> Thank you. Our next group. Who did you agree on and why? Uh, so our first one that we wrote down was uh, Eric Chappelle. Uh, we put him down mainly for the violent skills and protecting the public, which uh, I feel is largely the U.S. And so situation like this, the government needs to be able to help people know how to survive and teach people to do things on their own because obviously there shouldn't be a lot of chaos going on and protection for the public is very important. Uh, we had Margaret Pond give her army experience. I was a little concerned about the compromise and stuff, but I would think in a group of four, uh, one person can't uh, like hmm. unilaterally make decisions. Um, we have Rail Marshall, a little bit of concern about the ideology for now, but I think she's just a good choice as they start uh, learning how um, things, like how the zombie apocalypse can happen and how it's all going to get done for them. And then our major disagreement was between uh, Gerald Smith and Virginia Tech. Um, I was more concerned with Gerald Smith for the emotional damage that going with over his. Uh, like being overbearing considering how powerful he is, mm. money and land and oil and water, like having all of that, uh, there was concerns that he would be able to make decisions unilaterally because him pulling out would be like devastating. Um, but at the end of the day, Andrea Chen was, was very concerning uh, and pacifist to be a perfect fit that they could work together. Uh, she, she just directly clashed with the ultimate goal of surviving and defeating the zombies and the other members. Excellent, thank you. And from our last group, who did you agree on and why? Okay, so Charles Manson, liberty. Ooh. Dr. Ring brought out some very valid arguments that were valid, but then we didn't talk about Derek Powell. Um, <laughs> so we went with <laughs> Jerry Cooper, one of the people. So we started with Gerald Smith, um, really the man from the start. You gotta have the money, you gotta have the connection. Same thing, Andrew Chen, go with him. I hope so. Excellent. Thank you all so much. And, and no love today for Javier Costa. Interesting. But everybody else ended up on a team somewhere um, in the room. So I'm curious, for a show of hands, how many of you at some point in this negotiation changed your mind about one of the candidates? Show of hands. All right, let's hear from some of you. What was persuasive to you? If this is effective negotiation, what was persuasive in helping you change your mind? Yeah. Yeah.
Mm. Yeah. So like I gotcha. So you're like I have two interests. Yeah. One of them is disinterest in connections that I've heard about. One of them that I came in with is that they're like you need this person that's going to be like a facilitator, be able to help reach consensus on the team. But you were ultimately persuaded by this other interest that became more powerful, the connections. Yeah. Who else was persuaded and why? Yeah. Vehemently. Mm. So you were able to make it, you, you made a trade, essentially. Yeah. You said, I've, I've got, my, one of my strongest interests is to have Margaret Pond on the team. And why did you want Margaret on the team? Yeah, and you're saying, and um, for that, your your interest in having someone who'd been in the army, had, was a senator, was a good leader, had her experience, was greater than your concern. Your interest in having her on the team was greater than your concern about Gerald, and you were willing to trade on those interests. Yeah, so we have trade on interests here. We had here. You heard about new interests, and it prior, you prioritized them differently. What else was effective? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so like the problem is this, the way that I see it. It's X. And then when you start having the negotiation, they start bringing in more context to it. And you're like, oh, my interest may shift based on new data that I'm collecting. And thus that changes some of my conclusions as well. Yeah, you have anything too? Yeah, and this is interesting. There's a there's a bit of like an interest in her calming tensions internally, but then externally as well, she may be able to have a same effect in PR. Yeah, the other hand. Mm. Yeah, and this is interesting because sometimes we may have a, te a tendency in negotiation to treat it like a debate. I've come in with my, with my arguments, my opinions, my ideas, and when you're listening to others, you're only listening to things to negate in their opinion, um, to push back against in their opinion, and treating it like a debate. But instead, you said what I did was listen and onboarded things that made sense to me and actually changed. Because if we start in a debate and only use listening to the other person as a way to strengthen our own pre-existing argument, we're one, turning into positional bargaining, right? You're just trying to strengthen your position by learning about their interests. Um, but two, we may be missing deals that would be better or ones that we would actually like, like feel more confident in. So I appreciate you were listening and saying, here's the things that I'm gonna take from it, and I'm gonna learn from it and actually alter my um, opinions on what options would meet my interests the best, too. Let's do one last thought. What else was persuasive? Yeah, Reem?
Yeah. So you're able to build consensus around none of us like this, like the bat mask. Um, and I imagine it would have been a very different negotiation if you hadn't checked in on that and say Daniela was sitting at the table being like, actually, I know this US representative, and I think that they would be quite good. And you've got someone that views the BATNA differently and views walking through that stronger in it. But you were able to build from that too, and that was persuasive in saying we are, we are on the same page. We are trying to reach an agreement. Now how are we going to come to it? Excellent. So these, this really started touching on the seven elements of negotiation, right? You had interests that you were seeking to meet. There, there were various configurations of options. All of the different laundry lists that you can put together for are options to agree with. Your BATNA was very clear what was going to happen if you did not reach an agreement. Through communication, you learned more about the interests of the other parties at the table, what might be persuasive to them. And you were also learning things that were persuasive to yourself through their own assertion as well. Hopefully no relationships were destroyed in this negotiation. <laughs> Maybe some improved, or at least stagnant. I'm not really sure in this table over here <laughs> if there were some relational, relational challenges. And you've got a commitment. Now, another piece of it is criteria. There's not a whole lot of objective criteria on how to put together a zombie survival, zombie survival leadership team for a country, but you were, I heard, starting to rely on some criteria, even if it may not be apparent. Age, Hendr well, we may look at the number of age and how, you know, how long certain people live, but Henry Kissinger is still alive and kicking. So maybe we've got a different criteria that we're looking at there. We may be looking at criteria on how we want to form the team, the traits that we want to have internally. Here's our list of criteria and here's how we would meet it and also ones externally as well with the PR2. So you're engaging these elements. And as you can see, they come up through the discussion in negotiation too. So thank you all so much. Congratulations on forming your teams. I'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. But this is the process by which you get better at negotiations. Preparing for them, doing them, and then reflecting on them afterwards. So I encourage you all to continue thinking about things that you said that were persuasive, things that persuaded you, what went well, what would you do differently? What about the process work? What about the process didn't work in your negotiation? Because that's how you improve upon it in the future is reflecting back on what happened in the past. So good luck to you all as negotiators. I'm excited to hear how it goes in the future. Um, and also pop up here, here's my email address. Um, feel free to shoot me any emails, whether about negotiation, law school, Baker Center, et cetera. I'm happy to be in touch.